worship today, our second Sunday in Advent, we're on the countdown to Christmas. You have an announcement sheet, but I have some more for you. Uh, the Presbyterian Heralds are available today, and you can pick your copy up in the link. The Port Ballantrae Christmas Craft Fair is on the 10th of December from 10.30 to 4.30. The Property Committee meeting scheduled for today has been postponed until next week. And there will be a meeting of the Kirk Session on Monday week the 12th at 8 o'clock. This is the second Sunday in Advent, our second candle is going to be lit by Brian and Jilly. <clears throat> Today is the second Sunday of Advent, the Sunday of peace. Our peace is found in God and in his Son, Jesus Christ. John the Baptist and all the prophets remind us that to receive peace, we must be prepared for it. We light this candle today to remind us that Christ is the Prince of Peace, the one promised from the beginning of the world. We thank God for the hope he gives us and for the peace he bestows. Send your light into our hearts. Help us to be ready for the day and the hour of Christ's appearing. Work in our hearts at this time and help us prepare ourselves for the peace that he brings, the inner peace that tells us that we are united with you, and the other peace which will come when he returns to judge the world. Bless our worship that it may be pleasing unto you, and bless us that we may prove to be your faithful servants. Thank you. Psalm 72 is a wonderful messianic psalm that's often overlooked and neglected. We're going to sing it in a moment or two, or our version of it, but the last verses are our inspiration for worship today. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvellous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and Amen. We sing to God's praise our first hymn psalm. His name forever shall endure. Oh, his large and great name. Thank you.
God of majesty and power, who spoke and this world was, who breathed and this world lived, who counts the hairs upon our head, who sees our thoughts and reads our hearts, who loves us more than we deserve. We bring our morning prayers and worship to you. You know us through and through, better than anyone else, and yet you love us and work for our good. It was while we were still in sin that Christ died for us. How can we not worship and adore you? So to you, O Lord, we bring our lives, troubled, broken or at ease, a sacrificial offering for you to use. Take away our selfishness and teach us to love as you love. Take away our sense of pride and show us the meaning of humility. Remind us that you, our Lord, entered this world as a helpless baby, born to ordinary, humble people. Remind us when we get above ourselves that you were the servant king, coming to serve and not to be served. We thank you for your word which endures, for your promises to which we hold, for such intimacy with you. For the love which from our birth over and around us lies. We give you thanks for all these things and for our salvation which was not dependent on us but on you alone. Be present with us in this hour we pray in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. Ruth is going to bring us our first reading. The reading is from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, can the children come to the front, please, as usual?
morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to see you. I think one or two more are on their way. But I want to show you some photographs, uh, some pictures. We've got our first picture. Now, if you look to the animal on the left, what is that animal? Anybody know what it is? No? Anybody, any idea? Any big people know? <laughs> wolf, yes. You know what a wolf is, don't you? Well, you'll know the one on the right. What is the one on the right? Yeah. A lamb. Do you have lambs? Well, maybe not this time of year, or maybe, yes, this time of year. Um, I'm going to ask you, if you put a wolf and a lamb into a field together, what do you think would happen? Beth? You're absolutely right. <coughs> the wolf would eat the lamb. That would be breakfast for him, wouldn't it? So you would be watching out for your lambs if there were wolves about. Thankfully, we don't have any of them here, I don't think. What's our next picture? Um, now, the one on the left, you know what that is, don't you? What is it, uh, Mike? Um, a lion, that is right. So we've got a lion. And what's the one on the right? It's easy. A cow. A cow, absolutely right. Good man. Now, I'm going to ask you the same question. If you put a lion and a cow in a field together, what do you think would happen? Beth, you tell me again. You're right. There's a lot of eating going on here, isn't there? The lion would eat the cow. He wouldn't take too long to make the calf disappear. Okay, I think of one more picture. Okay. What's on the left? A cobra. Absolutely right. And would you like to meet a cobra? Yeah. Oh, you would. <laughs> Don't ask a little boy a question like that. Okay. Um, well, what's on the right? What's the picture on the right? Yes, please. A child, a little child. Now, although you might like to meet a cobra, I think if you put a cobra and a little girl together, the little girl wouldn't come off too well. I think the cobra would at least bite her or maybe crush her. And I'm sure, like me, she wouldn't really want to meet one. But I can understand boys. I know little boys used to fish for snakes in my congregation in America, they go to the river and then they'd bring them up to show you, which wasn't a terribly nice thing to see. But in our pictures, we've seen animals that are quite ferocious and animals that are quite tame. And we know that the ferocious ones would eat the other ones. But a prophet by the name of Isaiah, who wrote lots of things about God and wrote lots of things about what was going to happen in the future. He said a day would come when the wolf and the lamb would get on really well. In fact, they'd lie down and sleep together. The lion and the calf would do the same and a little child would play beside an ass or a cobra's nest. That would be a special day, wouldn't it? And do you know that special day is a day nearer every day that we live. It started when Jesus came as a baby at Bethlehem, which we're celebrating this year as always. But when Jesus comes back, he's not coming back as a little baby, he's coming back in glory with all his angels with him and the whole earth will be filled with his glory and everybody will be at peace. He's going to bring a world of peace, even with animals, and maybe even more difficult with people, with human beings, Jesus will bring peace. Won't that be a lovely day to look forward to when we live in a lovely world and everyone is at peace with one another? That's what Jesus will bring, and that's what we're celebrating this year and looking forward to the future. So I know you're going out to Sunday school to get ready for next week, but before that we're going to sing a hymn and hark the O oh, come thy long expected Jesus. <laughs>
Christ from Mark chapter 1 and reading verses 1 to 8. Mark chapter 1 verses 1 to 8. We hear the word of God. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop to untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We end there at verse 8 and we pray that the Lord will add his blessing to these readings from his word. We again join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, prepare us for your coming in the church. We pray for your church today gathering all around the world in tiny churches and great cathedrals to praise you and to hear your word. Give us a sense of expectation as we come and inspiration as we go. Help us to put our differences behind us and to unite instead behind the great commission of Jesus to make disciples of all nations and all people. We pray for your blessing on all those who preach and teach the message of your salvation. And we pray especially for our own ministers in PCI as they seek to do your will and proclaim your truth through this Christmas time. Lord, prepare us for your coming in the world. Drive away despair from our politics. Revive our dreams of justice and truth. Restore our passion for what is good and right. Establish your just and gentle rule in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and so many other areas of the world where there is still conflict and where peace has been powerless and violent people have had their day. We ask you to govern the hearts and minds of those who lead our nations and for those in authority that they may act justly with honesty and integrity according to your will. Lord, prepare us for your coming in our own community. In our daily life, help us never to forget the supremacy of love. May love motivate our care for our neighbourhoods in Bush Mills and surrounding areas. May love heal the social ills which sometimes drag us into despair. May love inspire our citizenship to rise beyond mediocrity and may we always remember that we are members one of another and that we can never live to ourselves alone. Lord, prepare us for your coming in those in need. On this day we pray for the hopeless, the refugees, the expelled and forgotten people everywhere 
And we remember especially today all those involved in the work of the International Justice Mission as they seek to make a difference for the oppressed and abused throughout the world. May they know that your guiding hand is with them in their daily work and tireless efforts. We ask you to help us all to use our gifts and our talents to the greater good of all. Challenge us to drive away complacency and apathy when we know in our hearts that we can do more to help and sustain those in need. We pray for others for whom this day will seem long and hard, for those in hospital or ill at home, those struggling with despair or depression, those seeking work, and for those for whom this day will be their last. Comfort and heal all who suffer. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. As we leave this place today, Advent Lord, come even nearer. Come to rejuvenate our faith. Come to fortify our service. Come to widen our eyes of wonder, so that when the Saviour comes, he may steal into our hearts and find them ready. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before we hear God's word, we are going to sing again. <coughs> Hark the glad sound the Saviour comes. <coughs>
You might go about it the old-fashioned way and go to the newsagents, buy a literal paper, come home and read it, or you might subscribe to an online version and it will be there waiting for you on your iPad in the morning. Sometimes newspaper editors state the obvious or can lead with strange headlines. I one or two here. If strike isn't settled quickly, it may last a while. War dims hopes of peace. Cold wave linked to temperatures. Blind woman gets new kidney from dad she hasn't seen in years. Man is fatally slain. Something went wrong in jet crash, experts say. An expert is needed to tell us that. Or it might just be not very good grammar. Miners refuse to work after death. Milk drinkers turn to powder. Iraqi head seeks arms. What paper you buy will depend on your own political outlook. But all newspapers will cover the same stories, maybe just from different angles. The four Gospels are a bit like four newspapers. They tell the story of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. But they write from different angles. Matthew begins his Gospel with a long genealogy because he's writing to the Jews and he wants to prove that Jesus really did come from the line of David. A recurring refrain in Matthew's Gospel is, and so was fulfilled what was written by the prophet. Luke is writing to the Greek Gentiles. He was a doctor, so he tends to write about the poor, the sick, the outcast woman. But he begins his Gospel with a very detailed account of the birth of Jesus. Luke knew that his Greek readers would identify with this perfect baby who grew up to be a perfect man. Mark, whom we read from today, wrote, we think, mainly for the Romans. And his theme was Jesus as servant king. The fact that he was writing for the Romans, explains his style, his approach. Mark describes Jesus as he busily moves from place to place and meets the physical and spiritual needs of all kinds of people. And one of Mark's favourite words is straight away or immediately. He uses it 41 times in his short gospel. Mark doesn't record many of the Lord's sermons because his emphasis is on what Jesus did rather than what Jesus said. And here there is Jesus as God's servant, sent to minister to suffering people and to die for the sins of the world. He gives no account of the birth of Jesus nor does he record a genealogy which would not be needed for a sermon anyway. But Mark, as we saw, dives straight in to tell us who Jesus is, to prove his identity. Verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as was written by the prophet Isaiah. There's no preamble, no introduction, no warm-up of any kind. This is who Jesus is, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Mark draws on several witnesses to prove his point. The first witness to assure us 
that Jesus is who he claimed to be is John Mark himself. He states boldly that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's likely that Mark himself was an eyewitness of some of the events that he wrote about. He lived in Jerusalem with his mother Mary and their home was a meeting place for the believers in the city. The book of Acts tells us that. Then the Apostle Peter calls Mark my son, which suggests he may have led Mark to faith in Christ. It's widely believed that most of Mark's writings about Jesus came from Peter's eyewitness accounts. Mark's special target audience was the Romans. And the word gospel to them meant joyful good news about the emperor. Now the gospel of Jesus Christ is joyful good news that God's son came into the world and died for our sins. It's the good news that our sins can be forgiven, that we can belong to the family of God and one day go to be with God in heaven. It's the announcement of victory over sin and death and hell. So it is very good news and Mark wants to communicate that to his readers. That good news is communicated to us too. We have a God who loved us enough to come to this earth, to take on our flesh and to die in our place so we can be forgiven. Good news. Tell me, has that good news penetrated <laughs> your heart and mine? Because forgiveness <coughs> results in a forgiving spirit. Love brings a loving attitude from those who receive it. Sometimes we are so familiar with the gospel message, so familiar with the Christmas message, that we lose sight of how good it is, we lose sight of any desire to let it in on us or affect us. It just floats on by. This Jesus Mark is telling us about, God, is God come to earth for us? For us? Then Mark goes straight to the prophets. To Malachi and Isaiah, I will send my messenger ahead of you, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Both those prophets refer to John the Baptist, the prophet God sent to prepare the way for his son. In ancient times before a king visited any part of his realm, a messenger or several messengers were sent before him to prepare the way. It might include actually repairing the roads for his entourage. But it meant preparing the people too. And by calling the nation to repentance, John the Baptist prepared the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah and Malachi join voices in declaring who he is and who he says he is. <coughs> so Mark himself is a witness, the prophets are witnesses, and then John the Baptist is a witness. John the Baptist would probably not be on your Christmas party guest list. He was a very peculiar, eccentric man. But 
But God chose him to prepare the way for his son. And Jesus called John the greatest of all the prophets. In his dress, in his way of life, in his message of repentance, John identified with Elijah, who was also eccentric. Now, the wilderness where John ministered is the rugged wasteland along the western shore of the Dead Sea. And John was telling the people symbolically that they were in a spiritual wilderness far worse than the physical wilderness their ancestors had endured for 40 years. They were in a worse spiritual wilderness. And John called on the people to leave that wilderness, to trust Jesus, to receive their Messiah, to enter into their inheritance. John was very careful to elevate Jesus and not himself. He repeatedly reminded people that someone greater was coming than him. John would baptize repentant sinners in water, but the coming one would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. John's message and baptism were preparation so that the people would be ready to meet and trust the Messiah. As we approach Christmas, we will hear many voices calling us. The adverts, the sellers, the charities in need, the newspapers, the children's I want, I want. We're surrounded by so many competing voices. We're in danger of not hearing the important voice. The voice crying in the wilderness to repent. The voice of God calling us to preparation. The voice of God calling us to repentance. You know, if you want a happy Christmas, a meaningful Christmas, you need to tune into that voice. What is that voice saying to you? Because you and I need to get right with God. That is our first priority. We can fool other people, we will never fool God. And a right relationship with him is our priority this season. And Advent is a time of preparation. There are all sorts of devotional books to prepare us for this season, to take us through this season. There are the wonderful Advent scriptures. You know, most of us drift in our walk with God. We stray off the path very easily. We fall back and follow at a distance. We drift and fall back until we've almost lost our way. Advent is the season to take stock, to prepare and repent. Repent means turn right round, turn around and walk with God, not away from him. Follow him closely. All of us here will have a happy Christmas if we take time to hear the voice of God to us and to act upon and to know his forgiveness for real or afresh. to finish with an illustration I read just yesterday. Wabush is a town 
in a remote part of Labrador in Canada. And for a long time, it was completely isolated, totally inaccessible. Then eventually, a road was cut through the wilderness to reach it. So Wabush now has one road leading into it. And therefore, if there's one road leading into it, there's one road leading out of it. If a person travels the unpaved road for six to eight hours to get into Wabush, there's only one way he or she can leave, and that's by turning around. Each of us, by birth, arrives in a town called Sin. As in Wabush, there is only one way out, a road built by God himself. But in order to take that road, a person first has to turn around. Turn right round. And that complete about face is what the Bible calls repentance. And without it, there's no way out of that city. Let us pray. Father God, prevent us from hearing your message again for another Advent season. Prevent us from just letting it soar over our heads. But motivate us to prepare and to repent where we need to. And to truly travel this season with you and know the full and real joy and satisfaction of the true Christmas. Amen. Our final hymn is on Jordan's Banks. 